This is a father at the bank wiring money to his child. Beneath China's bustling urban facade lies a large number of hard-working but poor labor workers like him. If this is what the blue-collar workers are like, what about the white-collar class in China? A report on Chinese online media has struck a chord with many Chinese white-collars. This article captured the daily commute of several ordinary white-collar workers in first-tier cities. The pandemic has resurfaced in the southern Chinese cities of Shenzhen, Guangzhou, and Dongguang. A 35-year-old man works in Shenzhen and his family lives in Dongguang, a neighboring city, due to the high cost of housing. He has to use three to four modes of transportation and it takes four to five hours for his daily commute. If there is overtime at work, it will be the early morning of the next day by the time he gets home. White-collar workers in Shenzhen said, In Shenzhen, the probability of dying from contracting COVID-19 is 0.001%. But if you don't work, the mortality rate is 100%. On June 28, at a press conference held by the Communist Party's 100th anniversary event, the CCP's Finance and Economics Committee announced that at the beginning of the Communist Party's rule, the national income per capita was only dozens of dollars, while currently, China's national income per capita has exceeded U.S. $10,000. The news quickly hit China's social media, Weibo, with nearly 10,000 comments under the official Weibo account of the state news agency, 99.9% .9 of which were from netizens who questioned and ridiculed the figure. Some netizens asked, is this dividing Jack Ma's daily income by 1.4 billion people? Another netizen wrote that it must be a printing error. The RMB must have been misprinted as USD. It is no exaggeration by Chinese netizens. At the 2020 National People's Congress, Chinese Premier Li Keqiang said, China has 600 million people who are in low to middle incomes and below. They make an average of about RMB 1,000 a month. The Chinese government does not provide transparent data, but fabricating perfect matching data is not easy. In a vast array of complex and conflicting official data, we can deduce which side of the coin is closer to the truth. For example, China's official urban median income is a more realistic indicator of the population's income than, say, per capita income. Beyond China's metropolitan cities, there are many smaller cities and towns. Official data shows that the average monthly wage in cities and towns for the first half of 2020 was RMB 2,205, or US 340. China is the second largest economy globally, and the world is amazed by its prosperity. Many of the luxury stores outside of China offer Mandarin services. But the reality is that only a small percentage of Chinese have become rich after more than 40 years of so-called reform and opening up. The top wealthiest are the communist bureaucracy and the businessmen who depend on them, as well as a few so-called elite figures in other fields. According to official data, in 2018, China had a rural population of 560 million out of about 1.4 billion. In 2020, the total number of rural workers in China was 285.6 million. Rural workers refer to peasants with household registration in rural areas, but working in urban areas. In the last century, under Mao Zedong, the rural population of China became lower-class citizens due to the strict household registration system, which lasted till 2019. However, even with the loosened household registration, they will remain rural workers if they cannot afford to buy apartments in the city. A rural household registration means that these rural workers in the cities will have no access to reliable medical and social insurance. Their children cannot attend schools or take the college entrance exam like their urban counterparts. In addition to the Chinese peasants, there was another large group of poor people in the cities, the so-called laid-off workers. 
In 1997, the Chinese Communist Party (CCP) began privatizing state-owned enterprises. The complete failure of the public ownership of enterprises in the past decades has made those state-owned enterprises a heavy burden for the overall economy. So employees from these enterprises have been dismissed and labeled as the laid-off workers by the government. This group has lost the benefits they previously enjoyed at state-owned enterprises. The Chinese government has not established reasonable unemployment benefits for them. In the end, tens of millions of workers, formerly employed by the state-owned enterprises, have been reduced to the status of urban poor. Those who can keep their jobs have to pay the price too. The managers of state-owned enterprises force their employees to pay for part of the shares of the enterprises. To keep their jobs, the workers have to dip into their family savings. However, they usually do not have the shareholder rights typically afforded shareholders concerning how the business operates. That is to say, these employees help the management of the company to obtain ownership. But when conflicts arise between workers and the management, the local government will support the latter because the officials benefit from such transactions as well. The CCP has made economic development its most significant achievement, which, in turn, is used to cover up all its mistakes. However, when a country's economic development is not focused on benefiting the people, such growth is of little value and can harm the people of the world. Now, China's poor population is beginning to impact the national economy significantly. More Chinese people are cutting back on their spending. Which means that China's economy as a whole is losing a vital pulling force. In 2020, the number of indebted people reached 780 million, with a 42% overdue rate. It means that at least 300 million people in China have delinquent debts. The number of reported dishonest law enforcement persons has reached 5.7 million, equivalent to one out of every 250 Chinese people. Dishonest law enforcement persons refers to debtors who owe money but don't pay despite court orders. Such debts include home loans, online loans, credit card overdrafts, and other types of borrowing. China has relied on real estate and public construction projects to drive the economy for a long time. Chinese real estate has now created a dangerous bubble that has put tremendous pressure on the country's banking system. In 2020, China's national revenue from selling use rights of state-owned land was RMB 8.4 trillion, up 15.9 percent year over year. China's local tax revenue was less than RMB 10 trillion. That is to say, in 2020, for local governments in China, the revenue generated from land sales was roughly equal to the tax revenue. While China's central and local governments are facing a similar shortage of money, the Chinese Ministry of Finance announced that on July 1, all revenue generated from selling the state-owned land will be transferred to the central tax authorities for collection. It is not yet known how this policy will be implemented. If China's central government puts an end to local government land revenues, the massive bonds issued by local governments for infrastructure development and real estate development will become unserviceable. Chinese media reports that six of China's most economically vulnerable provinces and municipalities are financially strained, raising concerns among investors. The six provinces or municipalities have started selling off bonds of their state-owned enterprises. Analysts warn. That the default rate in mainland China's U.S. 17 trillion credit market could skyrocket. International markets serve as a major pillar of China's economic development, but with the tension between the U.S. and China that seems irreversible, it is becoming increasingly unlikely that the U.S. will be able to lift many import tariffs. It means that China will no longer have the same opportunities for growth that it once did. According to an official Chinese survey released on June 30, manufacturing activity in China slowed down in June due to a weakening demand for exports and supply bottlenecks faced by producers. China's official unemployment rate for the second quarter of 2021 was 5 percent. But oddly, in February, data from China's National Bureau of Statistics showed that the unemployment rate for people aged 16 to 24 in China was 13.1 percent in February of 2021. 
the same figure as in the first quarter of 2020, when there was a major outbreak of the pandemic in China. In late 2020, a leading Chinese economist and director at the National Development Institute, NDI, of Peking University, Yao Yang, said in an interview with Tencent Finance that the NDI conducted an online survey of more than 6,000 people at the end of June 2020. It showed that the unemployment rate was as high as 15%, with another 5% in a semi-unemployed state. Given the troubled state of China's housing market, finances and banks, the good old days are likely to come to an end as the economic hardships of high unemployment and low wages intensify by the day. Thank you.